to Christ the Center, your weekly conversation of Reformed Theology. This is episode number 663. My name is Camden Busey. I'm back in Grays Lake, Illinois, here in the Reform Forum studio, and uh, delighted to be here with some friends to discuss uh, some important uh, matters regarding American religious theological history. So we're going to speak uh, on on another topic, uh, kind of following up uh, something we spoke with Bill Redinger about uh, maybe about a month or two ago about uh, resistance theory, and we got into the American Revolution, talked a little bit about John Witherspoon. So that's what we're going to be focusing on today. We have with us Jeff Waddington, who is the pastor of Faith OPC in Fawn Grove, Pennsylvania. Welcome back, Jeff. It's good to see you. Oh, it's good to be here in the slowly unpacking. You still see, unfortunately, boxes behind you, but Lord willing, that'll one day disappear. No, yeah, no trouble. Yeah, uh, <laughs> the many, many books, uh, to the reading of books, and I guess to the to the piling of books, there is no end. There is no end, that's right. <laughs> well, we do have, uh, 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 we are delighted today to be welcoming to the program for the very first time, uh, Robert Null. Uh, Robert is the author of uh, a wonderful dissertation that was, uh, you know, submitted to the faculty of Westminster Theological Seminary titled John Witherspoon's Forgotten Lectures on History and Chronology, Recognizing the Important Role of History in the Development of His Thought and Theology for Navigating 18th Century Late Protestant Scholasticism, Revivalism, and Enlightenment. Very Puritan title there. I like it. It's a full mm. full three lines on uh, eight and a half by 11, 12 point font. Welcome to the program, Robert. It's great to have you with us. Thanks. Glad to be here. Yeah, we're glad you're able to join us. We're excited to talk about this subject. And I'm, I'm also very excited to have uh, Jeff with us today. Of course, Jeff is a uh, uh, reads an awful lot in in history, but uh, has a particular fondness uh, for this era, of the American Revolution. I like the American Revolution, being an American myself, but <laughs> but uh, Jeff's got a lot more pages under his belt uh, on the subject than I do, and we're going to be speaking about this history today. Uh, just before we get started, I, of course, want to point people to the website. You can visit us at reformedforum.org. There you'll find information not only about all of our programs and things that we have coming up, but you can also uh, register for courses. And We have uh, four courses uh, available now. Three of them are entirely free, including the Introduction to the Theology and Apologetics of Cornelius Van Til, taught by Lane Tipton, uh, an Introduction to the Westminster Shorter Catechism, Questions 1 through 38 by Jim Cassidy, and my course on uh, an Introduction to Covenant Theology. And we have many more courses to come, but if you haven't already, you know, register for free. You can sign up for the courses, use them in your own personal private study, or use them among your family or even in your church. Uh, we try to organize them in a way where they're useful also for Sunday school resources. And also, while you go to the website, stay tuned for uh, information and news and updates about upcoming events. We we're regretful that we were unable to uh, have our theology conference in October in Grays Lake, but we are very happy to announce and discuss that uh, we are going to be hosting a lecture series at Mid-America Reform Seminary, and it's looking like, uh, as I speak, we I think we just finalized this morning. I need to just confirm that. But uh, October 8th at Mid-America Reformed Seminary, Lane Tipton will be present uh, to lecture on Van Til's Trinitarian Theology, and the subtitle for that lecture series is Reformed or Revisionist? Question mark. So if you ever have any questions or thoughts about Van Til on Trinitarian Theology, uh, you can uh, register and come to the lecture series. The lectures will be free but the space is limited, so you're going to have to register in advance. And if space runs out, or if you're just unable to visit or don't want to for, for health concerns or whatever may be the case, you just don't like Indiana, whatever, <laughs> um, then uh, I think more people are going to Indiana from Illinois than ever before. Uh, then uh, you can certainly watch online. We'll be live streaming the event as well as recording it and making it available after the fact. So I'm tremendously thankful Grateful to Mid America Reform Seminary, particularly their faculty, uh, Doctors Venema and Doctor Strange, who I was able to meet with and talk about this idea. And so we're excited to partner with them on this joint event. So more information at reformedforum.org. Thanks so much. Well, uh, Jeff, why don't you uh, just you know start things off uh, very briefly? Uh, tell me about your uh, experience with with Witherspoon before we uh, get started with the uh, Robert's dissertation I think it might catch people up on the on the subject right. a little bit 
Well, I mean, I've I've read a little. I've got the works of Witherspoon, the standard re reproduced set, uh, and I've I've got three or four or five. Well, including this dissertation, six or so volumes about Witherspoon. Witherspoon is one of those uh, figures, founding fathers of the United States, who is known probably best uh, in Presbyterian circles, but perhaps not much beyond that, mm -hmm. uh, except for maybe some professional historians. Uh, very significant as a pastor and professor in Scotland, and then recruited to be the president of what is now Princeton University, the big back time. then the College of New Jersey. And uh, did you overlap uh, learning anything about Witherspoon in your Edwards studies? I take well, it you did. Yeah, there. The, as you may know, uh, Witherspoon has been said to have come to Princeton and kicked out all of the Edwardsians and squashed all of the Edwardsian idealist philosophical ruminations that had been uh, set loose by Edwards uh, at Princeton, uh, and he seeks to re sought to replace that by. Uh, a Scottish common sense realism. So it's pitting a realism, a form of realism against a form of idealism. At least that's typically how it's portrayed. So there is there is a relationship uh, between the influence of Edwards or the legacy of Edwards and the, uh, the work of uh, uh, Witherspoon. Uh, I find him fascinating because he was a college, a minister and a college president and also a member of the Continental Congress, and I believe may have served in the, the state legislature of New Jersey or been involved in the form, formation of that. But Robert, Dr. Null can, uh, you know, give us the further de furthest details. Perhaps the, the, the first question to ask uh, Dr. Null is, is what, what made you into what what created your interest in, in John Witherspoon? Well, uh, my interest mainly in terms of, of studies, theological studies, um, I, was very, I was very interested in how what was the philosophical and theological milieu that created the mindset in the United States uh, in the early federal period. And having looked at that closely, um, it's a very complicated um, um, uh, discussion that involves uh, an Atlantic framework um, mm -hmm. of England, France, Germany, and other areas coming to the United States. And I was very interested in how the United States formed uh, in terms of its, its uh, relationship between philosophy and theology and how we got to some of the places that the United States has come to in terms of certain areas like government, um, law, uh, university system, um, theological seminaries, um, denominational systems. Uh, these are all major legacies that we work with every day in the United States. And yet there's very many opinions as to how we got here and what was important in the influence of how we got here. And I was interested in looking specifically at some um, foundational people in the reformed Presbyterian tradition that had an influence in this area. Um, being a, a member of a reformed Presbyterian church I was interested, how did this contribute to the growth of all these many areas of academic, government, legal, uh, medical, technological um, areas in the United States. And Witherspoon was a very key person because he was both uh, a very dynamic um, clergyman, he was a, uh, a statesman, and he was um, a university president. And so in all three of these areas, he had a very large influence. And the College of New Jersey, which eventually became Princeton uh, University, had a very overweighted influence uh, in the United States uh, and especially in the formation of reformed theological thought for many years thereafter, once the seminary was established sort of separate from the college, but yet very close to it. Um, his influence was felt for a long time. His influence on many members of 
the early uh, Continental Congresses uh, and the early Congress uh, is very, very extensive. His, his influence on Madison, his influence on other major uh, presidents of colleges on the East Coast was very extensive. So he seemed like a very key person. And a number of people have had different ideas as to what influenced him. And I wanted to take a closer look at that. And so that's part of the main areas. Those are the main areas that I wanted to really look at and think through when I looked at John Witherspoon. Yeah, it's it's fascinating. You know, our country was, was much smaller, you know, the colonies in terms of population. Uh, and But Princeton, uh, the College of New Jersey, uh, its influence clearly was was outsized uh, in terms of, it, I suppose, its population uh, on the campus. But uh, and uh, Witherspoon, among other things, was a, a major influence on James Madison. James Madison often can called the father of the Constitution. Uh, so there is that 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 political connection. Uh, just you know, one example of what you've already pointed out, uh, Robert. In in your uh, dissertation, the first portion of it, of course, is taken up with a survey of the scholarship, which is expected uh, of PhD students that they will do that because you're you're wanting to demonstrate uh, that there's a something for you to do, right? There's something new for you to some new insight or way of looking at things that you're going to bring to to uh, your topic. Um, so it, in, it's interesting that uh, it appears as though the theological aspect is, is one that's not gotten uh, as much attention in, in, as it, we think it should. Uh, tell us a little bit about your, your uh, the the results of your delving into all the literature, primary and secondary, in in your uh, research for the dis dissertation. Sure, there there is quite a bit of uh, research that's um, been done over the last two hundred years, and it has uh, different uh, foci and and different levels of depth and different levels of critical analysis. Um, early, early on. Um, from sort of the, the midsection of uh, Witherspoon's career, say in 1775 or so, up through the very early part of the 19th century, say 1840, most people recognize that Witherspoon was a very central uh, person, both in terms of his uh, work at um, the College of New Jersey and in his role in terms of uh, the American Revolution. And so people wanted to put his works together. And so um, Dilly in Philadelphia put together his works into a complete volume by 1800. And that spanned uh, typically four to eight volumes, depending on how it was put together. Um, and his, his works circulated and people recognized that he had a tremendous influence. It was often said among some of the British regulars that um, the American society had run off with a Scottish Presbyterian parson and started war. <laughs> and um, to, to some degree, there, there may be some truth in that. Um, and then after sort of mid 19th century, um, people kind of wanted to look back in a very nostalgic way on the early federal period. And, and Witherspoon was included in that. Doesn't have as much recognition as some of the other major founders like James Madison, uh, but he's, he's always and everywhere in the background. Um, and so there was a lot of historical recognition through the mid part of the 20th century that Witherspoon was important, but not a lot of critical analysis. And it really came uh, about in the mid 20th century that you really started to see a more focus, a bigger focus, a wider focus, a deeper focus on who was Witherspoon and what was he contributing in terms of his, his theology, his, his um uh, his philosophy and his overall influence in the area of academics. And that became, uh, uh, that's where most of my time in my research has been spent is in that area of looking at critical uh, work that's been done on Witherspoon since the middle of the 20th century. And one of the things I found out is that there really wasn't someone who was really looking at the historical context in as much detail as I would like to have seen. There are a number of dissertations and 
works towards the end of the 20th century that started to look a little more closely at the philosophic background um, that Witherspoon had and do an analysis. And some is starting to do an analysis of what sort of influence he had through things like his moral philosophy on certain founders like James Madison and others. And um, that's the main thrust of where I spent most of my work. And that's a relatively complicated body of, um, of, of work. And, it, and each writer kind of has his own interest on Witherspoon. Uh, I found out that there was not a lot, a lot of, there were a number of, of relatively, uh, a very high quality um, sort of biographical analysis of Witherspoon's life as a, a Presbyterian pastor and then as, a, as an academic and then as a statesman and then tended to analyze that. But in terms of looking at his theology and looking at the depth of his interaction of his theology with philosophy, there were actually relatively few works. Uh, one person that does get into um, that type of analysis is Mark Knoll, the American church historian. And he does um, echo what you often hear in the literature is that Witherspoon was a propounder or um, someone who was a conduit for, for what was called Scottish common sense realism as coming into the United States. And as I looked deeper into that, it's, I think it's an easy assumption to look at on the surface of Witherspoon that he does seem in some ways to bring some of the ideas that are foundational to common sense to the United States. But it, it's, it is um, an analysis that's still to some degree on the surface. And there are several reasons for that. One of the reasons is the whole area of common sense thought is not as well analyzed and worked through. In fact, there needs to be a lot more academic work done in this area to really understand the different stages of development in common sense thinking prior to really making a judgment as to whether Witherspoon was the, the person who brought over uh, common sense thought to the United States. And one of the issues is there's a scholar, S.A. Grave, who wrote a book on common sense thinking. But beyond that, there's not a lot of um, individuals who have spent time with common sense and shown how it has developed over time. And I think that's one of the complications for um, taking the, 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 the approach that Witherspoon was a propounder of common sense thought because um, the, the world of common sense thought and the world of philosophical thought in the Scottish Enlightenment um, has not had the type of analysis that would really be foundational to support that type of a theory. So for instance, um, one of the major players in Scottish common sense realism was Thomas Reed. And Reed's philosophy was sort of an interesting conglomeration. He was looking at the philosophy of Hume to some degree of Locke and certainly of Berkeley and had some issues with where empiricism in, in, the, in the British islands was going. And he came to a conclusion that there had to be a different approach uh, than Hume, Berkeley, uh, and others, and he he developed his own type of common sense thought um, that was a, a conglomeration of sort of super empiricism, foundationalism, and natural law all kind of wrapped into one. And you know what's right reasonably because as predicates to reason, you have these components to it. And that type of thinking got formalized in the late sort of 17. Um, 1760s as he his first edition of his book came out in 1764 and then really wasn't circulating till around 1767 1768 well at that point Witherspoon was on his boat coming to the United States and so right. he would have missed some of the formal development of Scottish common sense realism so it's hard to think of him as a strict propounder of common sense realism when the thought process itself in its maturation really hadn't sort of solidified until he was actually almost on his way to the United States. So one of the issues was, he was he involved in the background formation for Scottish common sense realism? And that is certainly accurate. Uh, he was certainly very interested in one of the one under-researched areas is the relationship between Berkeley and um, Witherspoon. Um, he had a sense, uh, some aspects of idealism that are to some degree somewhat underanalyzed. Um, he was he did react to some degree to Hume, um, and he reacted to some of the other French thinkers that were um, 
spreading ideas like Descartes uh, into the um, British Islands. So in his approach, sometimes the 18th century, which Witherspoon falls squarely in the 18th century, um, the study is called the study of the long 18th century. And when the issue becomes, what is the long 18th century? And the long 18th century generally is regarded as a period of time starting with Descartes' discussions of method uh, and his meditations of how he's laying out thinking up until the time just prior to um, Hegel's phenomenology of the mind and really specifically stops sort of with Goethe's poetical works. And in that process, Witherspoon is sort of in the middle and he misses a lot of the more refined works of common sense realism. And you can see this if you turn the clock forward uh, in Presbyterian, in, in um, looking at uh, the development of um, Princeton and the development of um, Princeton Seminary, and you, you move forward to a person like um, James McCosh, you can see common sense as being much more a part of the way he's approaching his theology and the way he's approaching his um, understanding of philosophy. And it's much more developed than Witherspoon. And so from the time of Reed to the time of Dual Stewart in Scotland, you have a very big uh, development of common sense, and it's used in different ways, and it's done, uh, it's done uh, with different dimensions. And Witherspoon is only at the really very beginning, almost prior to that process getting formulated. So it's hard to say that he was a proponent of bringing something that really hadn't fully developed to the United States when it remained basically in its final formation or or starting to have its final formation in mid 1760s in 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 scotland so um i i had some trouble with that that thesis because one of the most common um one of the most common um parts of of scholarship in looking at witherspoon was that he was a proponent of scottish common sense realism mm -hmm. and he brought that to the united states and it changed the nature of presbyterian and reformed thinking mm -hmm. and to some degree i take issue of that simply because very few people have any sort of developed analysis of the formation of common sense thinking that he's supposed to be bringing over and and i think that larger framework of which there still needs to be quite a bit of work done is not very well settled and i think you have to start to look at Witherspoon and his relationship to individual thinkers more so like Berkeley, like Hume, uh, to some degree Locke and other French thinkers, really prior to thinking about him as a sort of developed proponent of um, common sense thinking. And one of the other things that Witherspoon really brought with him was he did uh, like to have the Scottish universities were changing to be from a more tutorial system to a more broad sort of um, subject-oriented university system. And he, he does certainly bring that with him. And when he does his lectures on divinity, when he does his lectures on moral philosophy, his lectures on eloquence, and his lectures on history, um, something that, I, that the lectures on history is specifically what I add to his corpus of works, um, he, he's very broad in his approach. And he's purposely broad. He's not trying to... Uh, have a particular axe he's trying to grind, but he is, he is trying to introduce his students into the Atlantic framework of philosophical thought. And it's hard within that context to say he's actually a proponent of one particular form of thought, which probably had a lot more definition in 1775 um, than it did in 1765. Mm. So it, it's one of the issues that I have with that sort of approach, although there's some elements of it there. Um, some people will argue, well, in the water of the thought of the philosophical thought of Scotland in this very sort of first half of the 18th century, you could find elements of common sense realism that he brought over. And that may be true, but it's relatively broad in terms of its approach and, and much harder to tie down um, than people might think. And so um, my think my work was to look at specifically the, the research being done 
in the latter part of the 20th century and saying, okay, who is dig a little bit deeper than some of the surface comments that the scholars come up with about Witherspoon and say, is this really accurate? And one of the areas I challenge is the area that he may not be as much a proponent of Scottish common sense realism than most people think. And I think that there is a little bit more of him as a reform scholar than people often gave him credit for. And some of that comes out a little bit more in his work on history, which he sees as being much more linked to what God is doing in the world um, and more closely linked to a type of uh, un unfolding work of history that the Lord is doing in the world. And I found those areas to be particularly fruitful in this study because as, as you mentioned, um, you really want to, as in you're doing your dissertation, to have an area that's something new um, that had not been done before. And this was an area that had really been untouched um, and I thought really needed to be brought to the to the front. Hmm. So, uh, Robert, how did you, thank you for that uh, helpful analysis uh, on the relationship of Scottish common sense realism to, to, to Witherspoon's life and uh, tenure, partic particularly as president of the College of New Jersey. Uh, yeah, I, th I think when you when you lay it out the way you just did, it's almost like, pardon the pun, commonsensical uh, that 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 there is a uh, variety and a development in Scottish common sense realism. It's a school of thought, not just one individual, right? And as you mentioned, Dugald Stewart is someone who will take Reed's thought and I think uh, collate it and systematize it. Then you have others who enter into the bloodstream. Uh, and uh, later on, after the time of, uh, of uh, Witherspoon, you begin to have actually the influence of Immanuel Kant on Scottish common sense realism in someone I think like William Hamilton. Uh, and that creates a stir at old Princeton back in the day. Uh, so that, that the whole question of what is Scottish common sense realism and, and was Witherspoon a purveyor of it, you can't answer that until you actually know the, what it is and, and how it developed. And that's, as you say, the part that has been more assumed than researched. And so your work, and, and I wanted to thank you for actually doing the spade work to get to present to us something that had not been available prior to your dissertation, the, the lectures on history and chronology, uh, because that's, that's a, uh, and you, uh, you created that by, is that a coalition of student notes or, were, or did you have access to uh, lecture notes from, from Witherspoon himself? Um, those are all, all of the, um, there are no extant, um, uh, lecture notes from Witherspoon, all of the four sets of lectures that, well, three sets that were published and now mine, four sets of lectures that are available um, uh, are all from student notes. Um, so right. the student notes are are what's, what is available. That was mainly correlated um, by it, by Dilly early in the um, 19th century. But it really wasn't until until I started working on this that people found and, and that I found uh, the uh, there's about four manuscripts of student notes uh, for the lectures on chronology and history that really had been overlooked and those are in the archives of Princeton and the the um, Philadelphia Historical Society Library Library uh, Company of Philadelphia and other places on the on the East Coast. Um, from students that had taken these down. And it's, it's surprising how uh, in doing the text critical work that there's quite a bit of similarity between all the different manuscripts. So you can get a pretty good idea of what Witherspoon was lecturing. And this is pretty much the case also with the lectures on moral philosophy. If you look at most of the extant notes on moral philosophy, most of which are in the rare book room in uh, the Princeton Library, um, it's surprising how many, how, how similar the notes are uh, and how, very, how, how few variants there are uh, from the student notes. And I found that to be both the same when looking at the lectures on moral philosophy and also the lectures on history. And so you can put together a pretty good um, um, text of what would have been lectured uh, 
uh, by Witherspoon. And you can you can see that his style is a little more broad and a little less detailed, I think, than some of the um, people who want to pin him down on a particular philosophy. It, it's just not, the, the, the lectures just don't lend themselves to saying, okay, yes, he's, he's certainly a purveyor of XYZ. There might be a line or two in there that point in that direction, but getting it from the whole of those notes is very, very difficult. Um, but it, yes, and putting together uh, the, the notes on history, uh, the lectures on history, it's amazing how uh, similar a lot of these manuscripts were. And so I was able to put this together and kind of add it to the Witherspoon corpus for the first time so that people could mm. see that he was actually interested in history and in the development of chronology. That's tremendous. I, I mean, it, it seems it's exciting and it seems like the scholarship is moving and advancing. And as uh, somebody looking and hearing things from the outside, yeah, sometimes those those theses or those uh, hypotheses that oh Witherspoon came over from Scotland and introduced Scottish common sense realism, they become easy explanations, and then they just become widely adopted, and then they become kind of like the dogma. <laughs> and so it's helpful to right. to remind ourselves as scholars always to look into things and question maybe some of these assumptions, and then to do so on the basis of primary sources. So that's one tremendous value in, in your dissertation and in this critical edition of uh, the lectures on this subject that you bring to the table. I'm curious, um, just for the sake of situating things in my mind and in the, in the listener's mind, uh, a little bit of how Witherspoon came to America from Scotland in the first place, and then maybe, uh, if, if possible, just what eventually got him uh, to Princeton? I mean, what how did these big shifts happen in his life? Uh, did he just find himself uh, under God's providence, and uh, or were there some more, you know, uh, prior, secondary causes that are notable historically speaking that led him into these situations? Well, that's a good question. He was always aware of the colonies, and there were different uh, waves of interest in immigration from Scotland to the colonies. Uh, he had surprisingly uh, uh, a pastoral interest in doing missionary work to the Indians that's relatively unnoted in scholarship, uh, and that drove a little bit of his interest. He was approached, largely the reason he came um, to the United States really doesn't start in Scotland. It actually starts in the history of Princeton itself. He was the sixth president of Princeton, and um, Princeton started with uh, with um, John Dickinson, and then moved into Alexander Burr Sr., and then, and then into Jonathan Edwards, who was only actually a president for about six weeks before um, he was given a, an inoculation for smallpox. Mm -hmm. and the doctor who was performing it um, noticed that the smallpox had congregated in his throat, um, and he was unable to drink enough liquids to really help pass this mild amount of smallpox that he had, and so he died. Um, and then you, and then you, you had um, Davies and Finley after him. And one of the problems um, that Princeton had is it was situated between a, an increasingly divided Presbyterian church, a church that was interested on one side in the revivalism that was happening in the British Islands in the United States and the power of the revivalism to bring spiritual growth to people and to communities, and an older group of Scottish and Irish Calvinists that were skeptical of the enthusiasm of the um, revivalists, uh, both in New England and in the middle colonies. And as the revival moved from, the, from New England down into the middle colonies, um, there, was a, there was a lot of skepticism. And Princeton itself, College of New Jersey, was born out of uh, a number of what are called the um, new light or new side Presbyterians, those who were favoring revival to have a college that they thought would really present a more pure form of reform doctrine, but incorporating types of uh, or important patterns they saw in revivalism. Um, and so the first few ministers they picked were often uh, seen, especially Jonathan Edwards, as as understanding and having worked with and not simply denied some of the benefits of revivalism. Well, in Philadelphia, there was another group of Scots-Irish who were more interested in having a stricter adherence to the Westminster Confession and were more skeptical of the enthusiasm of the 
um, revivalism. And as, as Princeton had a number of presidents that died with relatively short tenures, either because of exhaustion or because of sickness, people started to think, who are we going to, as we, as we got into the last two of those presidents, um, started to think, where are we going to get our next president? How are we going to solve some of the political tension that's at home simmering beneath the surface in the Presbyterian church between those who were sort of new light, new side favoring revivalism and those who were um, uh, favoring a more strict adherence, a more um, uh, less enthusiastic adherence uh, in terms of um, affections and emotions to the Westminster Confession. And the United States at different times of its history, as things have become difficult to work here, has often looked overseas for an answer. And this was no exception to that. And so they looked overseas. You can actually still see this today. Sometimes when individual churches are struggling with certain issues, they'll look outside themselves, sometimes to the UK, sometimes to other areas, to maybe bring somebody in who will bring a fresh perspective on what's going on in the church. And this was no exception. And they looked at, they found, they, they knew of John Witherspoon and they knew that he was a champion of, um, of, of Calvinist orthodoxy in a way that was, that had some life to it in uh, Scotland. And they saw him as somebody that they wanted to bring over. And so they initially approached him. Uh, his wife was not at all interested in coming to the United States. You can imagine the, the trip by, by sea typically took six weeks. Uh, it was very unpredictable. Uh, sometimes the boats had problems, uh, took on water, they would sink. Uh, it was very, they, the, the Witherspoons had um, 10 children, only five survived. She was not really interested at all in, in doing this. So when they were first approached to come to the United States, she basically got up from the table and walked away. And people oh. from Princeton who were trying to approach him to come to the United States knew that this was going to be a hard sell because she was not interested. So the first sort of wave of attempt to get um, um, Witherspoon over sort of failed. And, and one of the top students at um, uh, at Princeton was kind of approached to become president. He said initially, yes. And as time, uh, but, he, but he dragged his feet. And as time went on, uh, there were a number of problems at home that Witherspoon um, got into when he was ministering in Scotland. Um, in just in terms of just being faithful to his call, um, he developed a, a few political conflicts with people uh, in um, in Paisley where he was ministering, and um, those uh, proved to be sort uh, sort of thorns in his side. Um, there was one incident where he heard of a number of um, uh, people in his congregation who um, were younger lads and they had, a, uh, they had gone to a tavern and been drinking and they had a mock, um, the mock uh, performance of the Lord's Supper. Well, in that era, that was Boy. considered unbelievably outrageous. And so sure. he wrote an essay called um, uh, Serious Notes on, uh, uh, I'm not, recalling the title, but it was serious, serious notes on um, educating young people. And he basically, in a, in a preface to that, very directly references these people. Well, that sort of kind of ruined their reputation in the community. And so they came back to him and sued him for liable. And so and the court found that he probably shouldn't have numbered them out. He should have maybe done something more anonymous. And he was fined and he appealed the fine. And they came back and said, no, we're going to stick to our fine. And not only that, you have to pay all of the attorney's fees, which amounted to about a year's salary. So he had some difficulties um, in, in Scotland, which um, I think uh, he thought maybe it's best if the Lord's calling me to maybe look at something new. And so in the second phase of uh, the Princetonians coming over to try to encourage Witherspoon to come over, they were successful and, and his wife was much more open to it. And so they um, came over in 1768 uh, got here in August of 1768 in Philadelphia uh, with their five children um, and made way straight to the College of New Jersey. And um, basically, we're seen, he was seen as someone who could try to walk uh, a sort of middle ground between the, 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 the more revivalist-oriented or new light, new side uh, group of Presbyterians and the older Calvinist 
group. And for the most part, his force of personality helped keep the school together at a very critical time. He was a bit concerned because he saw how, how short the lives were of the people who had been presidents at Princeton Seminary. And he was very concerned about that. But fortunately, the Lord blessed him. And he was there from 1768 um, from 1768 all the way through um, 1794, um, when his son-in-law, Stanhope Smith, um, took over for him and began to be president of the um, university. So uh, that's sort of the analysis of how he um, came here. And it was, he turned it down it, it, at least on one occasion, and then decided finally, okay, this is maybe the direction God's calling me. And part of his interest was in, in, in doing uh, missions work in the United States, either to the Indians or to um, the colonists. Uh, he was, he, he, he reached out to certain areas, uh, um, far areas like uh, the Bahamas to try to get students um, to Princeton. So he had a sense that he really wanted to, a Christian missionary sense that he wanted to reach people and he thought he could be an aide to um, the uh, Presbyterian community here, which seemed to him to be relatively divided. And to some degree, he was successful. And part of it just it was his force of personality. Uh, in some of the uh, notes of his students, you can see um, you can see this come out when they'd say if there was a dispute in class, the, the stare of Witherspoon alone was able to calm the class and get the class back in order. So he had a certain force of personality, which, which, he, he, which was common among some of the early founders like Benjamin Franklin and George Washington, where he had a sense of presence that really allowed him to bring um, uh, consistent peace and consistent growth to the college. So, uh, Robert, as we're looking at that, the critical work that that uh, reconstructing the lectures on history and chronology, what was uh, Witherspoon's goal uh, in in giving that series of lectures? Purpose. The, what was the, the purpose? There's really two two main purposes. Is one of the one of the questions that. Per, that circulated in Presbyterians at that time was how old uh, was the earth and what was the exact, the exact chronological framework for the earth. And he attempts to answer that. Um, and he has a relatively standard short um, creation uh, narrative of six to 10,000 years for the origin of um, the creation. Um, and he divides up history more or less along biblical lines of looking at from creation to Abraham, from Abraham to David, from David to the exile, from the exile forward. He, he takes that basic biblical theological framework and kind of drops it in his study of history. The second area was to actually just get the, the, the area of historical studies moving at Princeton. There was very little work done on this when, um, when uh, Aaron Burr Sr. and Jonathan Edwards, and to some degree Samuel Davies and Finley uh, were there. There was relatively little work done in history. Uh, most of the work was done in either Christian theology or some elements of new philosophy. Um, he's very famous for having come to Princeton and Jonathan Edwards Jr. was teaching there and he was very not interested in the way that the New England theology after Edwards was developing. And he saw that as um, to some degree a threat. There's not a lot on detail as to what his exact argument for kind of showing that group the door was, uh, but nonetheless, he was very uninterested in continuing that sort of um, idealist New, uh, New England type of theology that had started to come into the curriculum at, um, at uh, Princeton. And I think one of his offsets was to start a study of history, something that would introduce the idea of redemptive history into the curriculum at Princeton as a way to counter some of the idealism that he saw in circulating in the colonies. Um, the other one was just to give a general outlay of some of the uh, ancient cultures that he saw as very interesting and as, as providing some things that could contribute to the development of thought in the United States. And those were the core areas that he was looking to, uh, he was looking to promote when he developed his, um, his lectures on history and chronology. Very interesting. Uh, so 
as you as you were uh, constructing the, these lectures, is there anything that surprised you uh, in 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 reading the content of of the lectures or the notes of the students? Well, I think one of the areas that's very under researched is, is is taking a look at some of the work that was going on at Princeton under Witherspoon and 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 other similar 18th century figures. Um, for instance, if you take Jonathan Edwards, whose life was cut short, if you look at his theological development, it is it is strangely similar to John Witherspoon. He begins by talking about really doing a work on both begin by having a strange interest in the immortality of the soul. They start to get into very standard um, reform theological thought, and then they start to engage aspects of the Scottish Enlightenment coming from figures such as Francis Hutchinson. And in um, Edward's dissertation on um, the nature of true, true virtue, he begins to get into areas that look very similar to some of the types of thought that Witherspoon is getting into. And then towards the end, uh, Edwards is very interested in history. And this is very similar to uh, a, a similar 18th century pattern that you see in Witherspoon. And that type of analysis has not really um, been done. And I thought, as I looked at this, it's very interesting that you have a major, 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 major perhaps the most major um, reform thinker in the United States, Jonathan Edwards, moving in a very similar direction towards uh, looking at redemptive history that Witherspoon had. And I think one of the reasons that that's there is that the nature of where thought in terms of theology and philosophy was going by mid 18th century uh, was there was becoming a, 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 a focus on uh, abstraction nature, deism, um, idealism, uh, and its relationship to empiricism, and the whole relationship of, of reason and theology that was becoming very, very um, speculative and very, very um, ethereal. And I think there was a sense for him to say, look, despite all of this, we need to understand that God's work it got us at work redemptively and historically in the world. And we need to somehow bring this down to a point where people can see that it, despite all of the new thought and most of the students, especially later in Witherspoon's um, teaching at, at Princeton, were very interested in the latest European ideas and the latest European thought in terms of enlightenment thinking. And he had a sense that he really wanted to introduce, you know, despite all of the thinking that was going on, whether you can pin down exactly what the importance or the lack of importance of it is, God is still at work historically, and he is, he is unfolding his redemptive history in time, and this has been going on since creation. And I think, like Edwards, he wanted to bring the church back to that notion that, hey, you know, you can, it's okay to look at um, the beginnings of Scottish common sense realism. It's okay to look at um, the idealism that you find uh, in Berkeley. It's okay to look at what Hume might be talking about in terms of causality. But at base, you've got to come back to a sense that the Lord is at work in history and you're going to be part of that. And I think that's one of the reasons that he wanted to introduce um, these, I, these lectures on history and chronology and why he saw this was important. And I think it's something we need to add to the corpus in Witherspoon that has that dimension of, of bringing down um, the more heady, ethereal um, 18th century enlightenment thought into a realm that's much more biblical and much more um, uh, oriented towards what God is doing. I, I think that may, uh, Robert, be, be behind uh, it's just a guess or a speculation on my part, but but one of the things that Witherspoon would have reacted to with Jonathan Edwards Jr. is that uh, abstract, ether, ethereal, uh, detached, philosophizing. Uh, that even that you know, so it's been said that Edwards Jr. you know was booted out of his pulpit because of that kind of bringing that approach into his preaching. So it wouldn't surprise me. Uh, if that's what Witherspoon saw uh, and just said, we're not going to have that, They're, that's that's not helpful. Uh, and so and and so a, a series of lectures on history and chronology uh, 
would be important and would be relevant at that time because there were challenge uh, there was the apologetic element as well challenges to the uh, veracity of the biblical chronology uh, and so that that's intriguing I think uh, maybe further work on the relationship of Edwards and Witherspoon on this kind of thing would be uh, worthwhile. Uh, so at the end of the day, what, what, what does, um, what would you like to see uh, in terms of uh, appreciation for and building on and researching into Witherspoon? What kinds of things would you like to, to see happen? Well, there's quite a few areas um, that are open, very much open for research. One of the areas is what we just talked about is the relationship of um, the early 18th century thinkers like Witherspoon to American early 18th century thinkers like Edwards. And then looking at the relationship to of, of College of New Jersey under Witherspoon and the development of New England thought after Edwards and how that relates to Harvard, how that relates to Yale, how that relates to Princeton, how that right. relates to the College of Philadelphia, because they're all doing different things. And that's an area that's very under-researched. And so this is another area where you find scholars saying, well, we can deduce what Witherspoon thoughts because he took Jonathan Edwards Jr. and showed him the door. Well, it's not that simple because that area of, of thought had different um, types of appreciation in different universities. And um, what was being appreciated at the College of um, Philadelphia was slightly different than what was being appreciated um, under Witherspoon. And um, how it was relating to New England theology and the development was also different. So there's one whole big area that really needs to be researched. Uh, another big area is uh, the area of how um, Witherspoon's foci in terms of his lectures, whether it be on moral philosophy, on history, uh, or on uh, eloquence, or on divinity, was different from the patterns of uh, academic um, approaches to these areas in Scotland, in England, and in, in the dissenting universities, uh, and in the er earlier American universities like Harvard and Yale. Um, there's significant changes, especially in moral philosophy, I think Harvard's the only university now that continues the, uh, the study of moral philosophy. Um, coming out of the work on conscience that was very, very central to the 17th century um, um, Puritan thinkers uh, at Cambridge. And uh, there are changes as to why this is now emerging and why this is important. And I think that's another area that's very, very understudied. And I think if you wanted to start to look at the idea of how is Witherspoon a propagator, possible propagator of common sense realism, I think you have to start to look at what were the changes that drove uh, Puritan thinking at Cambridge and its work on areas of the conscious to move into this area of moral philosophy. And what would that mean also in looking at history. Um, and that's something that's very, very understudied in an area that could be looked at. Another area is to look at um, Witherspoon's influence on other um, uh, American founders like Madison. Um, there are two major works where you'll find one to two chapters uh, on how Witherspoon influenced Madison, but it's the work on terms of um, the Federalist Papers and relation and, and the relationship of the writers of those um, to Witherspoon and his thought is relatively understudied, um, and that's another very large area that 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 could be looked at because there are a number of individuals who studied under Witherspoon in terms of history, in terms of moral philosophy that populated as presidents other uh, universities in the United States, and then also worked as um, uh, leaders in Congress and what his influence was there is 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 another one where it's it, you find in the scholarship um, casual references to it must have been this but it's it's very unsupported by closer looks at how certain of his lectures influenced um, some of the uh, work of these individuals for instance some of the individuals that left uh, like Stanhope Smith to um, be a president uh, in another area 
uh, and then came back. He also did moral philosophy, but his moral philosophy was very different from Witherspoon's. He made critical changes, and the issue is why did he make those changes, and why did he keep the ones that he kept? That's an area that's that's very understudy. Um, and then I think there's the whole area of um, public theology that often comes up in um, our thinking of Witherspoon. And that's another area as reform thinkers that we need to think about because we throw around the idea of public theology very frequently, but it's very infrequently um, defined. Sometimes public theology means what's Christianity have to do uh, have to say about contemporary patterns or contemporary thought or contemporary cinema in our society. And that's essentially some type of cultural apologetics. Well, public theology in that sense converted to cultural apologetics, but public theology is, is more than that. It's, it's, are you trying to see how elements of theology could have an influence on uh, the development of um, general belief, um, of governmental belief, of legal systems? Um, in, in that area of how Witherspoon contributes to the idea of public theology and how public theology changed from the middle of the 18th century to the middle of the 19th century to the middle of the 20th century is another area that's very, very open, that would be very interesting to look at. Um, because the idea of, of, of um, public theology, especially in the, um, colonial early federal period had a very strong sense of uh, natural law in its background. And this is coming from both uh, Locke and um, his use of, um, of, of thinkers like Thomas Aquinas and others to, to integrate some type of natural theology in their thought. And what how this uh, interacted with Witherspoon and his lectures uh, is another area that's very understudied and could be very profitable for growth in this area. So what, what do you think, to, to kind of go off in another direction as we wrap up, uh, no doubt you're familiar with the, the kind of revolution that has occurred in the assessment of uh, Princeton, old Princeton theology. Uh, do you have an opinion on that uh, recent, recent uh, uh, change in the winds uh, at, of old, the, the assessment of old Princeton? Well, I, it's one of the areas that I didn't spend as much time on because it, it's principally the latter part of his life right. is his contribution in this area. So it, it, taking there really needs to be someone who will take a look at how he appears in the, the congressional records. It's another dissertation for another time. Um, not something that I could bring into um, um, the work that I was doing. Um, there's an old adage in PhD programs that there are there are the there are the really good dissertations that include everything, and then there are the ones that get done. <laughs> right. So you know, uh, I you have to you have to start to limit yourself on what you can you can get into. But that's that's an interesting area. I think one of the things that's often forgotten is Witherspoon decides uh, later in his career, although he was part of. Um, the early Continental Congresses in response to the Intolerable Acts, uh, in, response, in response to the Stamp Act, in response to different aggressions uh, by the British uh, in the American colonies, or at least perceived aggressions, uh, as that heated up in three different cycles. He was part of that, but there was a point where when Congress was really going to form and, and, and um, there was a need to have um, a constitution that would sort of formalize principles, he bows out and he moves into being in deciding to work more as the leader of the Presbyterian church. And so he was very interested in becoming the lead moderator in the combined sort of New England um, and uh, uh, middle America and to some degree Southern um, Atlantic area uh, presbyteries that were forming. And he wanted to uh, take a more central role than that and decided to sort of step out of some of his political leadership that he had gotten involved with uh, since um, 1775. May 1775 was his real beginning of his involvement in the, uh, the revolutionary activity. So his comments that would bear upon some of the areas of the right of revolution, the idea of civil disobedience, uh, are areas of another area of study that I did not have time to get into um, in, um, in my work. And it's an area that would be, uh, that's really needed, uh, for someone to spend time with those congressional documents and, um, 
uh, come to terms with some of the areas in here that are, are relatively unread. Um, right. But I, I see, uh, unlike some people who are, are thinking of Witherspoon as, um, he, although he was a, a revolutionary leader, in terms of the, the, the development of the more established, systematic, methodological, documented um, legal framework for the United States and the Constitution, he begins to move away and go back into the church. He decides he wants to be a clergyman at the last part of his life. And he leaves that to the group of students that he educated, uh, like Madison, and thrust them into that framework. And that's why I think it's very interesting. I think what's more fruitful, instead of looking at Witherspoon's relationship to resistance, might be to look at his influence on those who actually really spent hard time in terms of, of public policy uh, and public policy formation um, uh, that 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 he would have influenced. Right. Well, uh, I think this has been a wonderful conversation, Robert, and and your your work is groundbreaking in, mm -hmm. in many ways, uh, opening up for the reader uh, a world that is probably uh, closed to many people in our day. Uh, Carl Truman has said the past is a foreign country. Uh, and, and that is probably very true of, of uh, Witherspoon and his situation coming from Scotland and then serving as the president of the College of New Jersey. I want to thank you for uh, doing this work uh, and coming on the program and, and having this conversation. It's delightful. Uh, and uh, Absolutely. I'll, I'll let Camden have the last Do the word. stuff. <laughs> <laughs> uh, to, Robert, it really has been a pleasure to, to speak with you and, and to have you expound and, and further enlighten, pardon the pun. Um, a lot of this work. I, I trust many of our listeners who want to pick up a copy or at least uh, dig one up. Uh, the dissertation, um, if you're on campus uh, at or near Westminster Theological Seminary, or if you're a, uh, an alum, you can get into the PhD database, but you can also uh, find copies through ProQuest. If you're a scholar in that field, you'll, you'll know how to track this down. Uh, again, the shorter title, the abbreviated title here uh, by our, uh, our guest today, Robert S. Null, N-U-L-L, -L, is John Witherspoon's Forgotten Lectures on History and Chronology. A uh, tremendous book, that, or dissertation, I should say, and, and a wealth of information here on, a, on an important subject. So thank you for joining us today, Robert. It's been a pleasure. Sure. But glad to do it. Yeah, well, I uh, would like people to visit us online at reformedforum.org. There you'll find information about uh, what we have going on, as well as uh, ways for you to connect. And uh, you can dig through the archives and look at uh, the category that this falls under to find related episodes. And those should also appear in the bottom of the page if you're browsing the website. And if you haven't already, subscribe to the podcast. You can find it in all your major places, Apple Podcasts, uh, Stitcher, uh, Pocket Casts, you know, any of your major apps. Uh, you'll find it uh, there, and uh, you'll get the podcast automatically downloaded to your computer or your smartphone. But I do want to thank everybody for listening, and we hope you join us again next time on Christ the Center.